to the barber shop to get what is what I sometimes refer to as my hair cut. The kind barber said, I've been sick a couple of days, said, you know, my throat. Said, I had that, that, what do you call it? Orange ice. <laughs> and uh, didn't I get his orange? Couldn't be here this morning. But I didn't want to disappoint the people who I knew would come tonight to hear the first in a series of talks the four stages in the path towards spiritual perfection. Fortunately, before I got more anxiety and had to go to bed, I got my sermon. So, Brother McAfee, if you'll come up here and read my text, I'll take the time. I want Philippians 4, 7 to 15. But what things were counted to me? Three. 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 Yeah. Were, were gained to me those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, but done, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were all. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forget are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same. Now you give me your ears, Henry once said, and uh, we'll not miss anything, and by Wednesday I'll be okay and be teaching my class. Now, we have an objective before us. And that, repeat again, is to know Christ. It is to win Christ. It is to know the power of Christ's resurrection. It is to be conformed. It is to experience in us that which we in Christ. And in order to do that, it is to count all things lost, the excellency of this knowledge. Now, I have read it, and we've referred to it often, the prayer of the author of the cloud of unknowing, who says that he wants God to so help him that may have the intent of our heart so cleansed that we may perfectly love and worthily praise him. Now I listen today on the radio from early morning, lying in bed listening to the religious service. Thing from Catholicism down to um, spiritualist meetings. 
And it could be that some of you would say, well, nice chap, but he is a bit off base. No, I want to ask you, in light of the New Testament, this sounds fanatical. We are seeking a place in God a perfectly loving and worthily praising and be united not only judicially but experientially. Now, if that's fanatic, then of course there's only one thing for you properly to do, and that is not to come back anymore because that is it. But if this is worth listening, this is worth preaching about, worth little, that we might know Christ and win him and know his power to his death and gain a, a superior resurrection and experience in all which we have in Christ and be united with him experientially as well as judicially here in this present world then let's relax and say this is not from testament Christianity now the object of the Holy Spirit is twofold it is to convince Christians that this which I have talked to you about is possible and then it in as Joshua led Israel into the promised land. Now the first of this, please, is not hard. To convince Christians that that which I've talked about is possible in this life, that's not hard. People are ready to accept it. Well, accept a few die hard. But universities, Bible schools, and conferences of every kind of the evangelical and fundamentalist persuasion are asking for this. So it's not hard to convince Christians that these things are true. But it is impossible to lead them into it. For man, it's totally impossible. But not if so for the Spirit of God. For it must be the Holy Spirit that leads any individual to place of what we call the spatial kind of Christian, superior to and different from the common Christian. Now I want to read something to you, just a brief snatch here, from an old saint who said this, a persuaded mind and even a well-intentioned heart is a long way than faithful practice. Nothing has been more common in every age and still more so today, and we could add it in our day, nothing has been more common than to meet souls who are perfect and saintly and... Do you hear this? Nothing is more common than to find Christians who are perfect and saintly. But the Savior of the world says, you will know them by their works and by their behavior, and this fool, which is never deceiving, and it is by this we should judge ourselves. So said Fenelon. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb tonight and, uh, and claim to know something which I don't have to know except by a shrewd guess based upon known spiritual laws. I'm going to state here now that for some of you, now I don't know how many, but for some of you, week was your worst week spiritually. You have been dis in these talks. You heard about them and you said, this is what I've been looking for. And you heard four of them. Last week was your worst week. You hoped it would be your best. And you hoped that the path would shine more and more under the perfect day. But instead of that, you had more discouragement last week than you a long week before. You were filled with doubt and defeat. And uh, instead of what you've been learning these nights, 
lifting you up, you have cast you down. But you know I want to tell you something. Those who have been told and those who have known the rap piece of doubt eating at them, and those who have bumped their forms on the sidewalk as a result of defeat, are the same very ones who are getting near to God. But those who have been unaffected and are unaffected, and we can still be care, we can still be worldly and not minded, you have not been affected, then made the least progress. But those of you who have found things going against you, and in your life, to know Jesus Christ better, instead of it helping you, it is at you, you're very close to the kingdom. Now, I want to give you another little phrase of the but cloud of unknowing. And this sums up the teaching of the Bible. He says this, See who by grace he may. I want you to put that down. See who by grace he may. Or, to put it in our modern English, let those who can see by the grace of God. Or to put it in the language of the scripture, he that hath ears, let him hear. He that hath eyes to see, let him see. For he talks about eyes instead of ears. See who by grace he may. Well, I explained the first night that I'm a bit different from the old gentleman who wrote the book. In that he simply walked out on people if they couldn't. Few ganglers and runners and fleshly bothers and gossip and uh, money love even to look at my book. But I'm trying to help you, so I'm going to be a little broader than that. That God sits out those who cannot see in order that they may lead on by grace those who see. For remember that for Israel be as the sands of the seashore, yet a remnant shall be saved. He said that in the last days few should be found who were right. But many should wax cold. Now here was a man named Gideon. And Gideon was going to go up against him. And he got 32,000 soldiers. And the Lord said, you got too many. And go who by grace may. So he said, everybody that's afraid, you turn and 22,000 out of the 32,000 turned back. He said, you've still got too many. You see people among you that cannot see and that uh, you'll never be able to, to make Israelite soldiers out of to the river and tested them. When it was all over, he had 300 left. Now, there's scarcely a preacher anywhere wide of this terrestrial ball that what would give him his right hand to get those 32,000 born in the night to be cut down to 10,000. But 10,000 was too many. Not thinking about numbers, but about quality. So God sits out those who cannot see, but see who by grace he may. And he leads on those who by grace do see. Uh, as an explanation of why you had a pretty bad week some of the last week, and why your efforts to go on with God only got you into more bumps. Remember Christ's journey to immortal triumph. Garden, where he sweat blood. Remember Pilate's Hall, where they put a purple robe on him and smoked. Remember the desertion, when they all forsook him and fled. Remember the journey up Calvary. Remember the nailing on the cross. Remember the six hours. Remember the hiding of the fish. Remember the darkness. And remember the surrender of his spirit in death. The path that Jesus took to immortal triumph and everlasting glory. 
and as he is in this world. Now, that's what some call the dark night of the soul. If you're a Christian that will be willing to go into this dark night of the soul, and that's why there are very few Christians that ever enter in. They don't know the morning because they won't know the night. Now, but some people say, Mr. Tozer, I have known quite a while this deep. God has chopped me down and cut me down, and he's knocked down my business, and he's made... I've actually been tempted by the devil, but the morning hasn't come in my heart. Why? Why does it take so long? Well, it doesn't need to take long. Here's what the cloud says. This works a long time before it be once truly done, as some men ween, that is, some men think, believe. For it is a sh of all that men may imagine. For it is neither longer nor shorter, but even according to the stirring envy, even thy will. The trouble is, my brother, that the stirrings within thee aren't enough. There isn't a yet, and so the Holy Spirit can't rush in because there's no, not enough stirring within. I have said bodies as full as he wants to be, and everybody is as holy as he wants to be. And we think we want and don't, then, of course, we wonder why it takes so long. I'll tell you, we haven't gone on, Pastor, and why, why you that are, that are seeking but still troubled, why you have not up into the land? It's because you have not come to the end of yourself. We interfere with God's working in us. Who wills thou do but look on him and let him alone, but we can't get, God can't get us to let him alone. Keep up a good front. Instead of being humble and meek, Christians want a good front. And there's hardly a Christian to go to heaven when he dies to see old Jordan roll. But he wants to have a good front while he's here. As Paul, the apostate, said before him, he says, O oh God, honor me now before... And then we hide our uh, inner state. It is a teaching of the Bible that we ought to expose God, but we hide our inner state. And because we hide our inner state, God can't change that inner state. And we disguise our poverty of spirit. I said, I think once, already, that if uh, we to look on the outside the way we do in our souls to Almighty God, we would be the most embarrassed people in the state of Illinois. There would be people barely able to stand. There would be people in rags. There would be people too dirty to be decent. There would be people that have, uh, that have great sores on their bodies. There would be uh, persons that are, that are, that uh, even Skid Row would turn them out. But we won't let know how poor we are in spirit, and we won't tell it. That's why we have to wait so long. And that's why we want with God, but why we don't. Because we disguise our poverty of spirit and hide our inward state, preserve our reputation. And then we want to keep some authority to ourselves. We don't want to turn the last heel. We want to have a, a, a dual control and let the Lord run it, but have control before us in case the Lord so. We're not turning over all the authority. We just don't tend to do it. And that's why we have to wait so long. Keep some glory for ourselves. We want a little bit. We're willing to, to, to sing the glory design. Thine is the kingdom and the glory, but we want a little glory for ourselves. Fenelon said again this, strangely ingenious in perpetually seeking our own interests. And what worldly souls do cruelly, people who want to live for God often do more subtly. You get that? It's almost humor. But it is so that we're strangely ingenious. A man that couldn't invent anything can invent a way of seeking his own. Because what worldly souls do crudely and openly, 
People who want to live for God often do more subtle, with the help of some pretext, which serving them as a screen prevents them from seeing the ugliness of their own behavior. I think that's a classic, brother, that our strange ingenuity, our strange ability to seek our own interests under the guise of seeking the interests of God. And I haven't the, rem uh, the, the remotest fear to say that there are thousands of people who are using mission and prophecy and the deeper life and uh, all the rest for no other purpose, secretly to promote their own private interests, but using it as a pretext and to serve them as a screen so they'll never know how ugly they are inside. Now, we contradict, I say. We rescue ourselves from the cross. Nobody wants to die on a cross, and I, I want to die on that cross, and I want to know what it is to die on the cross, in order that if I might have a superior resurrection, Those who, but that's what he said. He, did, he didn't say, so he'll raise me from the dead. Every Christian will be raised from the dead. But he said, I reckon like his, a superior resurrection. And in order to do it, I've got to die like him. Now, we're willing to die. And we're willing to die a piece at a time. But we're always wanting to rescue a little else from the cross. And it's that part of yourselves that you rescue that keeps you in trouble all the time. We're contradicting ourselves. You know, it's entirely possible to do it. It's entirely possible to beg to be this the filling. Beg and plead to be filled and yet hinder God from filling. He wishes and wills on him and let him alone. But we beg him to help us and then won't let him help us, like a spoiled child. If you want to take her or give them a pill or, or, or do something for them, and they howl and bawl and yet beg for help, but won't take a thing. Won't take a thing. And won't let you help you. Just stubborn little fellow. And so we beg to be something. This the feeling. And there's that strange ingenuity. There's that strange contradiction uh, that our wills won't stir enough. And uh, what worldly people do crudely to live for God often do more subtly. Before God, of course, it isn't subtle, but uh, it's subtle before us, that's ourselves. And that's the problem. We live in a state of contradiction. We beg, fill me now. There's one song that I sing around here. Oh, you know, I don't make any show out of it, and if somebody's announced it, why, well, it's okay, I can sing it. But I think one of the songs ever written in all this wide world is the song, Fill me now, fill me now, fill me now, fill me now. That's a hopeless song. It's so gloomy and hopeless, and I'll, I'll pay, uh, I'll, I'll give that book to any man who will find me anybody who was ever filled while singing, fill me now, fill me. just doesn't work that way. We resist God and say, fill me now, and sing all four verses and repeat the last. Mournful melody. Fill me now, fill me now, but we're resisting God. We, we're part of us, we won't let die. We want to keep it alive. And we're never going to let anybody know the poverty of our spirit or the terrible state. We're going to preserve our reputation and our glory, a little glory anyhow, and thus live in a state of contradiction. And that's one reason why Christians are not happy. A man who's always on a cross isn't happy. It's when he gets over with that and says, into thy hand I commend my spirit, and uh, ceases to defend himself, and it's then that he dies, but also there's a resurrection that follows. Now, if we're ever going to be more than common, mediocre Christians, you know, Christians halfway up. That is halfway up from where, not halfway up to heaven. That's not, I'd settle for that. But I don't mean that. I mean halfway up from where we were to where we ought to be. 
That's what I mean, halfway up the peak. But halfway up to where we ought to be, that's what mediocre means, you know, I told you. And the reason that we're most all mediocre is that there's no, not enough stirring within. And we'll never be anything but that until we give up interest and cease to defend ourselves and put ourselves in God's hands and then let not try to tell God how to do it. I'm perfectly certain that being the kind of man I am, that if I were having a surgery, I'd want a spinal block so I could stay awake and help the surgeon and instruct him. I know it. I always am prepared to make argument and tell the doctor what to do. And he said, Amen. But uh, it's this thing carried into the spiritual life that hinders us. We want to tell God what he ought to do. Get all out. We read the life of Adoniram Judson, and we say, Now, God, I want you to do that. Or we read Moody's life, and then we say, Lord, we want Moody. Now, God couldn't pour the Holy Ghost on you walking down the street of Philadelphia. Some of you have never been in Philadelphia. We want to tell God how to do it, at the same time preserving a little bit of the glory and having some areas in our lives been crucified. We want to be crucified uh, technically, and we're very happy to go listen to another, the sixth chapter of Romans, on how we're crucified with him. But uh, nobody wants it. We want to hold out something. And until we put ourselves in the hand of God and let him alone and let, go, let ourselves go and let go and let God We'll just be what we are, mediocre Christians, singing happy songs to keep me blue, and uh, trying to keep up a little the best we can, but at the same time we're not mess and we don't know what it is to be one with him experientially, to have the intents of our heart so clear that we may perpetually love him and worthily praise him that we may be filled with his spirit in victory. Uh, we just can't come to it. And it's all our fault. So remember, remember, this is no long time before it be once truly done, as some men ween. You're one of the fellows that ween it takes a long time. I want to tell you right now, you got it wrong. He says it's one of the quickest, shortest works ever men may imagine. And it's just as short as will. Just a short old, this, this reminds me of the old camp meeting preaching I used to hear. This old fellow, he's saying the same thing that he preached in the camp meeting time. And people wanted to be holy. Now, and brothers and sisters, what about you? You to let yourself go. Some of you young people are afraid of the will of God. And I won't talk about the will of God next Sunday, but you're afraid of the will of God, and you're hanging on hard onto something. You're afraid if you let go. Do you have a little baby and you love that little baby? And if you let that little baby go, uh, you God will take him, God will take him. God will take him away, you say, and sob it out as I did and lay on the floor. When we had a two two boys, Bud and Law, lay on the floor and where I was being entertained when God spoke to me and wanted I thought he meant. He wanted them to die. My wife was back home taking care of them. And I was in the evangelistic meeting. And I lay on the bed and kicked my toes on the carpet and cried to God and finally gave up my two boys. Great big fellas, except one of them was in the war and got his leg hurt. And that the, by the grace of God, he didn't lie there and die in the cold. But he's all right. Son's fine. Both boys all right. And four others. After that, so you see, God didn't want my boy. He just wanted me to get rid of him. He wanted to know he could have him, that's all. He just wanted to, to know that I wasn't partly dying, that I was willing to give up. And he had our girl. She'll excuse me, I suppose, to be embarrassed. But when she was born, why, uh, uh, I had to... And I did some dying, I tell you, brother. We dedicated her, but that was nothing. Dedication before before the congregation. That That's possible as much. <clears throat> but my dedication was a terrible, bloody, sweaty thing. And I finally, before God, said, yes, you can have her. I knew God wasn't going to let her die, 
because I had learned my lesson when I their two older brothers. But I didn't know what he wanted. And I told this in a testimony. I said, the dearest thing we had, she was a little tight then, year old or so, and I said, uh, but God can have her whenever he wants her. Somebody came and said, afraid to talk like that. Aren't you afraid? And I said, afraid? Why, I put her in the hands of perfect love. Can't wound anybody, and love won't hurt anybody. If Jesus Christ was a devil, if he was a cruel beast, shield her from him. But his name being love, and his hands being pierced, and his face shining sun, and his heart being the tender heart of God in compassion and loving kindness, I know he So she was safer with him than she was with us. And nobody was ever a better than my wife. And I said it to her, and I say it to you, that uh, they never came better, and that we, we kept the thing, and she didn't die. God didn't want her to. He just wanted me to put her in his perfectly loving hand. Not something. I don't know what it is. But it's something. You've got a boyfriend. And you hang into that boyfriend. You can't say, you can't say, you've got a girlfriend. You can't say, I'll give her up. You've got a job. You can't say, I've got, I've got an ambition. You've got a passion. And you can't bring yourself to say, yes, God. You've got, uh, you've got money. You got a nice or nicely lined uh, nest, a nest egg in it, and you just can't bring yourself calling it yours. You just can't let go. You don't know what it means to look on God and let him alone. You hope he's all right, and you believe he's all right, and you know it says God so loved and all that, but still you're afraid if you let go, What'll happen to you? I was going to tell a story about a man who was down in a well. Today on the radio, I heard a preacher, I think he was a Lutheran, if I remember. I don't know where and what, what the, it, it was supposed to illustrate, but it perfectly illustrates what I, uh, the old uh, Cervantes' old book, uh, that's the way I pronounce it. Remember that there was a kind of a clown in the book by the name of uh, Sanko Panza. One night, Senor Panza hung to a window sill all night, hung all night long, afraid to let go, for if he let go, he knew he'd plunge down and die below. And when the morning light came, he found he was two in off of the green grass. But he hung all night onto the window sill. In the morning, at least he saw if he'd just let go, he'd been down on the ground. Perfectly safe. Now, uh, that sounds humorous. Some of you whose knuckles are white from hanging on to the window still. And the Lord's been saying to you, look on me and let go. But you won't do it. You won't do it. You uh, are not going to do it. You're going to go to heaven. You couldn't miss that because you accepted Christ, of course. Miss the, the book. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I may know him and the affection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death, better than I have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and you can't, and reaching forth unto those things which are made to, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Sixth C. May. And the rest can sit around, get old, and wait for the undertaker. Go to conferences year after year and get Hear sermons year after year, not get anything. Go into Bible studies year after year, not make any progress. Just barely keep your up above the water. See who by grace he may. But we're ingenious, surprisingly, in fixing our Christian life so we get a little glory out of it and get our own way. Instead of... What about you? Bert Miller, I want you to come up to the platform, please, while I talk. Brother Reverend Bert Miller, here and we'll come. Yes, he should. All right, now, my friends, what about it? Here we are. We're the church, the deeper life church. Here in the city, uh, we're not Pentecostal, and uh, we're not eradicationists. 
there's a there's a life of supreme victory in Christ, a union with him that will lift us above our and will take us through the dark valley of of dying and bring us without the weight and burden of sin. Having given up everything and yet having everything. Have still been safe. Now what about you? That's all my talk for tonight. We make some advance next Sunday night and I'll feel better and I'll preach a little longer. But that's all for tonight. Now what about you, my friend? If you remember Jesus, remember what was said about him. That uh, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now do we stop there and close the book? No. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him in every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Up out of his stone he raised the Bethel. Up out of his dying came a living and a exultation and triumph and victory. And so it is for every child of God. We won't let him conquer. We'll never con conquer us. And the way we conquer our enemy is to let God conquer us. Not rush out at your enemy. Let God conquer you. And by doing that, God conquered every enemy. Will you do it? Are you interested to be supremely victorious in this life? Filled with God's Spirit, gifted of His Spirit, to walk a special kind of Christian. Not to be proud of it, but to be meekly, meekly, humbly thankful. Good grace of God you see. For remember, see who by grace see may. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. But there's a lot that won't hear. You have too many, get in. Too many. Too many. Tell everybody it's afraid to go back. 22,000. Still got too many, get in. Put them to a test down by the river. 300 of them went out to victory. The 32,000. What is that, 